and disappear. Um, and you will be able to see all of my lovely slides. So give me just one moment to get that up. And then we will be good. Okay. Oops. Almost. We're almost good. Hold on just a second. Hold on a moment there. <laughs> Try that again. There we go. Okay. So tonight, in case you you uh, you forgot where you were, you missed the beginning. We are talking about the science behind bird banding, um, and it should be a really cool topic. If any of you guys were here for last year's presentation about what is bird banding, um, or you've seen any of. Uh, of the banding demos that I or anyone else are doing around. Some of this may be familiar, but there's gonna be a lot of new information in this this year as well um, for anyone who, who wants to go even more in depth. And in particular, what we're gonna be talking about today um, are some of the newer technologies and strategies that are developing to help study birds in the hand, to help study birds while we're, we've got them in our hands and can ban them. There's a couple other kind of cool things that I threw in, but that's sort of the, the basis for what we're gonna be talking about. So a little real quick about, about me and what I do. Um, I studied biology at Washington College. I was an intern at the Center for Environment and Society and then an assistant biologist out there. Um, I've been an editor for North American Birds. I've worked, been on the, bird rep, the Maryland Bird Records Committee um, and have been an education specialist at the Maryland Zoo. So I've sort of bounced around a combination of field work and education -y things for, for most of my professional life. Um, and currently, I am the program manager at Birds of Urban Baltimore, um, where I run, manage a handful of bird banding programs in the city and some outreach associated with that. These are some kind of fun pictures of things I've done working in Nicaragua with caimans and banding mannequins in the tropics and all kinds of neat stuff. You do fun things when you're a field ecologist. So a little about BIRB, about the organization that I work for and what we do. Um, Birds of Urban Baltimore supports research on urban bird populations and helps get people out in their parks and, and, and experiencing them in a different way and sort of understanding and appreciating the natural history and biodiversity that's all around us, even in very urban areas. Um, we also provide training and career opportunities to folks interested in learning um, about ecology and conservation careers. Um, we have an environmental justice aspect of our programming where we try and provide training to underserved populations. So I do, a whole, again, sort of still I'm doing a combination of things, education-y and science-y. Some fun pictures of what we do at BIRB, some of the banding demos so that folks, if you haven't seen, can see a little of what it looks like to be at one of our banding demonstrations. Um, over on the side here, I do have um, my cat birds, and the other one is just me showing the cat birds. Oops, let's go guys. Okay, and here's a couple more of that. So you can again see the kinds of stuff that we're doing. I'm in the one photo with the, the ruler. I'm pointing out some things going on in the wing of that bird to teach someone how to age it, how to tell how old it is. I mean, the other we're teaching people how to handle birds. So now a little bit about BIRB, a little bit about me. So the main thing you're here for tonight, bird banding. Um, and why do we do it? Why are some of the reasons that we would go through um, this process? Why do we need to catch birds to study them? Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's, it's a, it, bird banding is a really longstanding um, uh, practice amongst the uh, ecological and in particular bird scientists, the community that does that. The We believe the first bird banding that was done in um, North America was John James Audubon informally tying um, ribbons onto the feet of birds in his uh, properties and seeing if they returned year after year. There's similar anecdotal evidence of people doing that in Europe even longer back. Um, there are native communities who are finding ways to track birds. So this idea with figuring out where birds are going is, is a fascination people have had for a long time. Um, and this is sort of what the process looks like. This is what a, a, a bird banding setup looks like. The, there aren't a lot of great photos of this part, so these are a little blurry, but you kind of get the idea. We've got a pole, a long net strung between another pole, and you can see through the middle, there are these long lines, but then there's also um, rather a lot of 
open space in the middle or what looks appears to be open space in the middle. And that's the part that the birds are getting caught in. When they're flying through an area, they don't see these mist nets, run into them and then fall into these loose pockets that are hanging between. There are other ways you can catch birds. There are traps that you can use. Um, I don't have good photos of it because it's hard to get photos of, but there are also cannon nets which can be used where a net is laid along a beach and tied to the end of two rockets and the rockets are fired over a large flock of birds to bring in a whole bunch at once. So there's a lot of um, different ways. Most of them rely on a net in some way. And once you've got the birds and you've caught them, the rest of bird banding is really about gathering data um, about those birds, about what you're catching. So every bird that we catch gets measured. Uh, we figure out how old it is, if it's possible to tell whether it's male or female, we determine that. We take information about the molt, about how it's replacing its feathers. Um, we take information about any body condition that we're seeing, if there's fat deposits on the bird, if it has old healed injuries. And then of course, every single bird also gets a band. That's where the bird banding name comes from. And um, there are some, I'm gonna go back a couple slides because you can see on the, the photo of the sparrow that's on the branch, the one that's not being held, <laughs> the one that is sitting on a, on a leaf, on a stick. You can see a bunch of colored rings around its feet if you look closely. And those are the bands. That's what a band looks like when it's on the bird. Um, on that bird, he's got a bunch of them. Not all birds get multiple bands when they get, but, but every bird does get a metal band that is numbered and that number will stay with the bird for the rest of its life. So that if it's found dead, the band can be removed and read. If it's caught somewhere else, the band can be read and recorded. If, you know, if the band falls off somehow and it's found on the ground, you can still pick it up and send in the, the number and record it. And that way, this information isn't just in a silo. That way there are other people, there's a network of folks out there who can access it and utilize it. So now we're gonna, that's the basics. That's the sort of the, the bare bones, what banding is at a, at a bare minimum. It can be employed in a lot of different ways, but you're generally, you're trying to catch a bird, give it some kind of permanent marker, usually a metal ring around the leg so that you can recognize it again. And at its sort of simplest core, that's what banding is. And it lets you do a lot of different things. Um, that simple process, like I was saying earlier, it lets you figure out things like longevity. Because if you catch a bird every single year and it's got a ring on its leg, you can be sure that's the same bird year after year after year. And because birds are often faithful to territories, that's not uncommon. Banders, if they're going to the same place year after year, will often catch many of the same birds. And a lot of what we know about how long birds live, um, about very basic aspects of their biology, like where they, when they leave to migrate somewhere else, a lot of that comes from that just very basic level of putting the bands on, seeing how the body condition is and aging them. Um, there's a lot of really good data you get that way. However, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can get if you start to get more complicated and start to throw some other things into the mix. So the first thing that we can talk about is sort of a, um, a new or, um, uh, different thing uh, or the sort of a different version is color banding um, or flagging. There's two terms for this. Usually when it's on a large bird and it's it sticks out from the bird like a little tab, like on these shorebirds, these red knots that are in the lower corner, that's what we call a flag. When it's a series of colored bands, like on the field sparrow and the grasshopper sparrow that are again in this photo, the field sparrow is the one I'm holding in my hand that has the yellow and blue. Um, on these guys, those are what we would refer to as a color band. Now, I've also included this photo of the woodpecker with no color bands so that you can kind of see what a just plain metal band looks like. Um, so I've got a you know, field sparrow in my hand and then right next to it, there's a red bellied woodpecker. So you can see how much of a difference those colors make. They make it much more obvious both that there's something on the leg um, and, and you know, obviously when there's multiple colors, you have a pattern so you can get more complicated in, in the individuality you're recognizing. So the grasshopper sparrow as an example of that. This grasshopper sparrow was one that I was working on in Maryland. This is the uh, Eastern grasshopper sparrow population um, that is, is found across most of Eastern North America and parts of the Southeast. Um, and what this project was about was we were, we were banding them and color banding them to see whether older parents were better than younger parents at raising chicks successfully. 
that's something that's hard to do just with a metal band because you can't sit at a nest and tell who's who if all of your birds just have metal bands and you're not actually catching them and reading the number again. So that's where these color bands come in. You can sit at a nest and you can watch the birds come back and forth and you not only know whether or not that's a bird you've encountered before, but you can actually know individually who it is because with these multi-combination, multi-color combinations, you can recognize lots of birds in a population. So this grasshopper sparrow was GBSX, which is green, blue, silver, and then X is what we use for the metal. And GBSX was at the time about five years old, which is a reasonable age for a grasshopper sparrow. And um, what we were able to do was compare GBSX to the pair in the plot next to him, which included an eight-year-old female and a two-year-old male, and this one with a five-year-old male and a one-year-old female, and compare those mixed age pairs to pairs that are just older birds and pairs that are just younger birds and start to look at what role that plays in raising chicks. A very similar study was the point of this field sparrow study for the guy that I'm holding up above. Um, in that one, in addition to looking at age of the parents, we were also looking at provisioning rates. So we were looking to see whether um, individual birds had particular preferences and food item they brought, whether females, for instance, preferred caterpillars and males preferred something else, because in some birds that happens and we don't necessarily understand why all the time. Um, so uh, again, being able to recognize your individual birds within a population visually, that's you can get a lot of cool stuff that way. The same idea follows with the flag. The reason you use a flag on these shorebirds though, is because if you think about a shorebird where it's gonna be wading around in the water, if you had three little rings of color along its lower leg, like we do for a songbird, that's gonna be underwater a fair amount of the time and it's gonna be muddy when it's not. So instead we use these lettered and numbered flags that stick out about an inch or so from the body and that can be read from a distance so that you have something visual that fits the behavior of the bird. Another good example of fitting that to the behavior um, comes in the collars that are used for geese. I don't have a great photo of that in this presentation, but some of you may be familiar with that. You may see geese sometimes that have yellow collars around the lower part of their neck. Um, and usually there's three or four numbers on those. That's a version of flagging. It's just like with a songbird, you wouldn't necessarily see the colored bands on a goose's leg, right? They're walking around, they've got short legs, they're in the water, but a colored collar is easy to recognize. So these are some, um, so another thing that we can do in another sort of uh, set of information we can gather and techniques that we can employ when we're bird banding is um, different things that help us understand molt. And this is another sort of one of the more basic aspects of banding, but there are some kind of neat parts of it. And what the first one that I want you guys to look at is the one of these two blue wings on the side. And the blue wing on the bottom is lovely. It's got very black centers to most of those feathers and very bright blue edging to most of them, except for, of course, that band of, of uh, sort of coppery red in the middle. The top wing is the same species and the same sex bird but we're looking at obviously a very different wing. We're looking at a wing that's much grayer. The blue is limited to the shoulder and we don't have that rich coppery red color. We've got a kind of rusty orange instead, a paler color. This is how we age a bird. This is the way we age our birds. These are blue gross beaks. The adult male is on the bottom. The young male, what we would call an SY, a male in its second calendar year is on the top. So this is another thing that when you've got the birds in hand and you can study large numbers of them, you can figure out a lot of neat things about the way they're replacing their feathers. Some of them are very simple, like these blue gross beaks I've shown here. Sometimes you get complicated birds like the brown-headed cowbird that's next to it. This is a female brown-headed cowbird with a molt pattern, um, a bird I caught six or so years ago with a mole pattern that um, has only been documented once or twice before in North America. And we don't really know what why it happens. It's only been documented in females. We don't even exactly know the age of these birds. We think they're, they're three-year-olds. What we believe happens is for some reason, they skip part of their first molt. So when they're in the nest and they're growing in their new feathers for the first time, normally they would 
rather quickly start replacing those. Juvenile feathers are not great quality. The, the, the feathers that a bird grows in its nest are not necessarily the best. So fairly quickly, they're gonna start losing those. And that's really how we age them, is that we can see those dull young bird feathers versus darker, nicer adult bird feathers, um, just as you can see in the grow speed. With the cowbird though, we seem to have multiple generations. To my eye, it looks like we've got at least three or four generations of feathers, the very darkest feathers that are kind of near the body, then those very, very pale feathers, and then those ones that are kind of an in-between shade and they're all kind of mixed in with each other, especially in the inner part of the wing like that. That could have to do with food availability. Maybe this is something that happens when they don't have consistent access to food. Maybe they skip some feathers in their molt, and retain poor quality juvenile feathers instead of getting new ones. Maybe it's an energetic trade-off like that, but we don't exactly know. And that's one of the things that we can really only figure out by being able to catch these birds, hold them in our hands and see them year after year and see if this is something that happens all over the country. See what happens if someone catches this individual bird again, has she furthered her molt at all beyond this or is she still holding on to a weird pattern? Um, so that's sort of a, another sort of vaguer and broader thing, but it's, I think, an important understanding to have about some of the things you can learn about this. In particular, um, when we move on to what I think is one of the next things. Yeah. So as we move into some kind of fun things, one of the, the neat discoveries of the sort of um, last 20 years has been that a lot of birds fluoresce under UV light and that a lot of birds, when their feathers are growing, um, there are chemicals that are laid down in them that are believed to strengthen the feather while it grows, but then don't really have any use once the feather is grown in. In that case, what happens is you get these gradations of feather color under UV light because you have the um, feathers that grew in the most recently that retain high levels of those UV fluorescent chemicals are going to be a brighter, deeper pink than the feathers that are older and have lost more of that UV reactive chemical. The chemical they believe is responsible for this in this species is uh, a porphyrin, um, which again, they don't know exactly beyond that it has some structural purpose in the feather. It doesn't seem to have any other main function, but it causes their feathers to fluoresce under UV. And birds, it's important to note, can see into the UV spectrum. So this is not something that is only visible to us when we put a UV light over the bird. To other birds, this is what they look like all the time. And that's why I include this really lovely photo <laughs> of the um, unfluoresced bird of a bird not under UV. So you can see the kind of color palette that this species is normally decked out in. This is a Northern saw wet owl. They're one of the smallest owls in North America. They have a very complicated migration pattern. So they're very heavily studied. And they're very difficult to age because as you can see, all of their feather tones are shades of brown. And it's very hard to tell on a wing in the dark, what's dark, what's light brown, what's tan brown, what's worn brown, what's bleached brown. And those distinctions are important. So we can instead hold a UV light over them, see those porphyrins and those chemicals reacting with the UV, and not have to distinguish between shades of brown because instead we can distinguish between shades of pink, which is a lot easier. So on this bird that you can see here, the feathers nearest the end where the hand is are brightest pink and the feathers nearest the body in what we would call the wing pit are the brightest pink. These other feathers are much paler. When you see two chunks of feathers like that, uh, only two colors, whoops, what we're looking at is, a, is a, a second year bird. That's a bird that has been two, through two molts. He's got two generations of feathers. And that is the way that we age almost all saw wets. At big saw wet stations, a lot of the time, it's straight to the black light when you, when you catch them. Um, and it's a really neat thing. Uh, they think there are other birds that do this, um, but it isn't well studied yet. That's one of the reasons I've included it here. This is sort of one of the leading edges of, of sort of active bird description as it's ongoing, is describing these alternate UV reactive plumages and these aspects of plumages that, that have not been described before. And what we're finding is that there's a lot of probably utility to the birds and being able to see into the UV. I mean, think about them being able to know the age of all the birds around them and therefore being able to more accurately gauge who's a competitor for a nest site, who's a competitor for a mate, is this a young bird? 
that's passing through my territory and leaving, or is this someone I've got to, you know, duke it out with to get access to the mice around here? Um, and so having this ability for the birds to visually determine age is obviously valuable to them. There are also species where the UV reactivity has been linked to sex differences instead of an age-related difference. There's a lot of species where the feet and the beak fluoresce UV. And in those cases, they think it's often a sex-related difference. Um, they know that in budgerigars, for example, the little parakeets that everyone likes to have as pets, um, there are differences in the, those cheek spots that they have. Many of us are probably familiar with them, these green parakeets with the dark spots on their cheek in the pet store. And those cheek spots actually fluoresce in UV, and there's a difference in the fluorescence pattern between male and female budgerigars. Um, so there, we're, we're still learning this about a lot of species, and it probably is much more important to them than we even know now. This is the other reason that I want to talk a little about molt and feathers. This is another kind of newer thing that's sort of just starting to be common. It's been published about for maybe 10 years now, five, 10 years or so now, but it's, it's just becoming common, and it's called isotopic feather analysis. And what we do in isotopic feather analysis is when we've got a bird in the hand, like in those earlier photos, it, it could even be a, whoops, it could even be a saw wet. It could even be one of these guys. Um, say we've got this guy. What we can do is if we've, we've got him and maybe we've just put a band on him. And so we don't know anything yet about where else he's been. Because right, that's, the, that's one of the things about banding is once the band's on, you can learn a lot of information from that point onward but anything prior to the band is kind of a black box. So what we could do if we wanted to know for some reason where these birds were coming from, where maybe they, what region they had been in most recently prior to, to Maryland, and it wasn't banded, normally you'd kind of be out of luck. But with isotopic feather analysis, what you can do is you can clip off one of these feathers, like is shown in this diagram up top, and you can then cut some of the veins out um, in a feather, there's the shaft, which is the central part, and then there's all these veins out to the side. And as you can see in the diagram, what you can do is you can cut some of these veins, you can break them down, put them through a very expensive piece of machinery, and what it will actually do is it will look at the carbon and hydrogen stable isotopes. And if you have some isotopes of those elements to compare it to, you can match them up. And so you can look and see if you have, for example, examples of stable carbon and hydrogen isotopes from Canada in a very rural area, it's going to be quite different than the carbon and hydrogen stable isotopes in a very urban area of Canada versus a very rural part of the Midwestern US versus a part of this deep South. There are, there, are, there are subtle chemical signatures that are different. And what happens with those isotopes is they stay in the bird, the bird's body after it consumes food and drinks from the region. So as it's drinking water, the carbon and hydrogen elements are not leaving its body. They are remaining oftentimes in the feathers and those trace elements can be detected by this very expensive machine and then you can sort of guesstimate where your birds may have been coming from. So what it looks like after you've run all the complicated analysis is something like this chart over here. These are all white-winged doves, which is sort of the Southwest's version of a morning dove. Um, they're very common in, in, the, in the Southwest in Texas, but it's not really known what those populations do, whether they're migratory, whether they're resident, whether it's a mix. Um, and so what they did is they took dirt samples, soil sam or soil samples, water samples, and a handful of samples of common food items of white-winged doves, which included things like saguaro cactus flowers, um, grain from silos that was spilling over. And they ran uh, from four different regions, desert regions in Arizona, agricultural regions in Arizona, Texas, and New Mexico. And then they caught birds in each of those regions, took feather samples, and compared the stable hydrogen and carbon isotopes to the ones found naturally occurring in those environments. And what they found was there were consistent differences. You can see that the um, Texas birds in particular, particular cluster near the middle of this reading, near the middle of this graph, that's where all these 
plus signs. Those are our Texas birds. Whereas our Arizona uh, agricultural and our Arizona desert birds sort of occur in two blobs on either side of that with the New Mexico birds mixed in the middle. So it, it shows, um, it does show some stuff. It will show you a broad region and it will also tell you some kind of interesting things if you drill down to a finer level. So in this paper, they noted that you'll, you'll see that there's a handful, not a ton, but a handful of Arizona agricultural marks mixed in near the top with the Arizona desert marks. Most of them are down at the bottom, but there's a few that make their way up. What the researchers noted was that the birds that those marks, those ones that were in the wrong place, so to speak, where they were, those were birds caught in fall, well after the breeding season. So what they believe was happening were birds that had, nest, that had nested in one place were moving and they were catching birds that had nested and had recently been eating and drinking primarily in agricultural areas had moved elsewhere and were now elsewhere in the landscape. And they were catching those agriculturally associated birds in other habitats. So it, it's a really neat process. It's new, it's, it's still got some kinks that are being worked out. Obviously you need to have samples of the isotopes in the, in the regions you're curious about to tell, that can be a problem. Um, we were, one project that I've done this with was with yellow-billed cuckoos and we were catching them in Texas, Oklahoma, and Pennsylvania, and trying to see where they had most recently leapt from on migration um, by taking uh, feather samples from each of those regions um, and seeing if there was any difference in where the birds were coming from. And what we were finding um, was that if you have good samples, you can get pretty good results. For the Eastern birds where we didn't have great isotopic samples from the likely wintering grounds, we weren't getting very, very good matches. But in Texas and Oklahoma, we were finding a lot of evidence that our birds had most recently been in Belize and the Yucatan, um, and that, that it was appearing to be sort of a staging area for them before they moved into the Southern US. So that's an example of some of these, again, supportive information that you can get this way. So this is a fun one. This isn't. This is one I threw in that is not specifically banding, but it's new enough and it's exciting enough, and I just think it's one of the most fascinating things out there. So I wanted to talk about it. This is migration. This. These are examples of migration radar, and you know, if you looked at unfiltered, just raw from NOAA radar maps of the U.S you have probably noticed that they don't neatly show blobs of rain moving across a blank country. There's a lot else that's going on in the atmosphere and radar can pick up on a lot beyond clouds and water and things like that. It can pick up birds, bugs, um, and other, other things that are moving through the airspace. So what happens is if you look at this photo that is, um, on the, the, uh, the single photo of, I'm trying to come up with a description, I'm really, these are all black background photos of the United States. <laughs> the one um, which includes the uh, central United States and which is on its own on the, the left side of the screen, the one that's sort of off by itself. On that map, you will see that you've got some big blobs of green that look like rain sort of across the middle of the, the country. But there's a lot of what we, what we in the birding world call donuts, which are these circular green and blue blooms, which are forming all around. So what these blooms are, are birds. Those are birds that are taking off and moving across that radar center. And it is picking up the flock of birds. You can see that it doesn't pick them up as far out as it can pick up rain. That's why they have this halo effect where they fade out the further from the station they get. But uh, if, if right over the radar stations, they can pick up bird movement, they can pick up direction, and they can pick up density to an extent. So the greener spots in these donuts are the densest groups of birds. The thinnest whitish and pale blue are the, um, the sparsest groups of birds. And what you can see here is visually in real time, what happens when huge walls of migrating birds hit storms in the middle of migration, because that's what's happening here in this picture. A storm, all these big green blobs of rain are moving across the center of the continent. And if you notice, north of the storm, right over the Great Lakes, there's kind of a, a dark spot. The migration isn't as heavy. The blooms are small. There's less green. 
And in the further north you go, the more you just lose the migration altogether. So what's happening is these birds are coming north, hitting that blob of rain and then being forced down. And you can see that from the very heavy migration that's occurring south and east of the storms and the really light migration that's occurring north. So that's what it looks like if you just pull it up raw, don't do any kind of analysis or filtering to it. There's other things you can do with this data. On the very top screen, I have this one that's in blue or, or purple and orange. And what this is showing is average um, migration traffic rate over the course of the last hour. So this was showing last night between 11 p.m. and midnight. This is timestamped midnight. So it would have been the hour prior to that. Um, and what this is showing is what the average rate of movement was in the direction in the places where migration was occurring. Where it was black, it wasn't picking up enough to, to produce a map. But in the places in the east and on California where enough birds were going over that stations were finding them, you can see it was able to produce these orange arrows, which showed the average direction of birds over that station. And uh, the deeper colors show the higher numbers or the denser clouds, so to speak, of birds moving up. And again, you can see where we started to drop off based on where the, the dark spots were. And those are areas, if you look at last night's wind maps and see where there were scattered showers, where there were areas where the wind was not out of the south, where the wind was not pushing the birds north, migration drops off. So through the Midwest, upstate New York, New England, those were places where conditions weren't conducive last night. Whereas here on the Southeast coast, we had great conditions and it reflected in the detection of migrating birds. And you can see when they do this, they can kind of put out a, a guesstimate. It's not perfect, but a guesstimate for how many birds were moving over the country in that period. Last night during this period, it was up to about 53 and a half million birds that were moving across the US um, based on these patterns that we were seeing. And they were almost all moving in a, from basically, the Mississippi West, they were going to the Northwest and from the East over, they were going to the Northeast. Now on the bottom is another version of that that shows the direction a little better. It's very hard to show the direction in still images, how they pick that information up. But you will notice that over this map in the bottom where the US is in gray, that amongst the blooms, there are tails of sort of green and white that streak North those tails show the direction of the bloom at the time it passed over the radar station. So similar to how you can sort of um, put in arrows in the, in the process data to show what the general movement of birds was or where the general movement of birds was, in real time, if your radar is picking up that, you can also see it on the map. And that's one way that they, they show this in the, in the after fact um, analyses. And you can see, again on this map, that these birds were very clearly navigating around hazards. We have birds in this lower map all the way from Florida. There's trails um, all the way from Florida that go in towards the center of the continent before they start to stream north. And it looks like there's a little bit of rain lingering over the outer banks that was probably closing out migration on that night, forcing these birds further inland um, than they might have gone otherwise. Um, and so we can, being able to look at that and see it both in real time and afterwards has been a really powerful tool for figuring out what's going on, you know, up in the air, especially at night when we can't otherwise see and know, but also in figuring out where important stopovers are. Because since you can kind of see where these blooms generally are occurring and where they're disappearing um, and in the morning and in the evening or, or in the evening and morning respectively, you can also over time start to identify where there might be particularly important stopover areas um, because you'll be able to see consistent blooms appearing over that spot every dusk and descending over that spot in the dawn again. All right, this is one of the re other really fun ones. These are nano tags, and this is probably the other newest and sort of most uh, exciting thing for banders. A lot of bird banders have, have 
said that we're sort of living through a second golden age of tracking birds. You know, after we discovered we could put bands on huge numbers of birds, that was the first like big discovery. And there were migration stations everywhere banding huge numbers of birds to track movement. Now, this is sort of being considered one of the next big revolutions. And there's a couple different versions of nanotags. These are these very, very small, very lightweight backpacks with some kind of transmitter device. It varies whether it's a GPS uh, a satellite linked transmitter or whether it's radio, um, whether it's a radio transmitter. Many of them, this one that's photographed is not a new enough one to show this, but these days, many of them have a little solar panel over the center that allows them to be powered for longer and collect data better um, and more, more consistently. Um, and you can see against this penny, they are tiny. This is what would go over the back of the bird. Um, and these loops that you see sticking out get attached over the bird's legs, kind of like it's wearing a little waistband or a backpack. Um, again, this is an older one. We don't use these types of loops anymore. We use a much smaller, more comfortable loop that, that um, is, is fits better against the bird that does not um, cause as much weight. But I really wanted to use this photo because it, it really shows how tiny they can make these things. That, that this, that, and that's really the revolutionary part of this is that they can make it so tiny um, that it can go on birds that we had no real way of doing this kind of tracking with before. It used to be that really the smallest thing animal that you could put a radio transmitter or a satellite transmitter on was a bird of prey or a sort of mid to small size mammal. Maybe you could push it for some big shorebirds, but you were kind of limited. Now, you can put them on almost anything. So you have on um, this stripy bird, you have this stripy bird on the side is a bobolink, which is a type of blackbird or a relative of the blackbirds. Bobolinks have a really long migration that has a lot of steps to it. Um, so they were a high priority species to put these backpacks on once the technology existed, because we knew that from their breeding grounds, they go somewhere and do something <laughs> because they vanish from the breeding grounds in the middle of summer and they reappear in a different plumage um, in different locations. And then they vanish again and they show up again in South America of all places. Um, and they do the same thing on the northbound migration. So very clearly, this is a species that's jumping. It's not making a slow, steady meander across the continent and, you know, taking 50 miles a day, maybe 100 if it's ambitious, skipping a day when it rains. They're picking up and going long hauls at once. And in order to study birds like that, you kind of need to be able to see where they're going as they're going there. So bobolinks, these, these transmitters were put on. And what we're starting to see is that they undergo what's called a molt migration, which is a migratory period separate from a breeding to winter season migration usually occurs between that one. Uh, so if your bird, if a bobolink migrates from its wintering grounds to its breeding grounds in say late April usually, and then returns on its breeding, in, that returns to its wintering grounds in October, the molt migration occurs somewhere after it has bred and before it goes back to South America. In these birds that appears to be August, usually late July and August, and what they do is they largely abandon the breeding grounds and move to more coastal locations often, um, wetlands, uh, parts of the Mississippi drainage, and they sit for a couple weeks and molt. And basically the males replace almost their whole plumage. Um, the females replace most of the flight feathers. And that is from where they actually depart to South America. And because it's done in big jumps, and it's done in habitats that people don't usually look for bobolinks in, it has been missed until we've been able to put these transmitters that provide an element of real time recording. Because that's really what these do. They're small and because they're talking to a radio tower or a satellite, you get regular updates as the bird moves. And what you end up with are something like these. We'll go back to that other picture in a minute. But what you end up with is something like these, where you can see more accurately than just 
someone in May caught this bird in Cuba. And then a year and a half later, I caught it in Maryland, which is a lot of the time how this goes otherwise. Um, the way this can work fundamentally is that the satellite and GPS ones, of course, talk to satellites and then those data can be downloaded onto computers and analyzed in more or less real time. That one's simple. <laughs> the satellite and GPS technology is, is, is better established, but it's more expensive. That's the trade-off. However, there's this thing called MODIS networks. And a MODIS network is what is pictured here. Each of these yellow dots is a MODIS tower, which is a radio tower with a receiver on it that is tuned to the frequency in which MODIS tags transmit. And MODIS tags are a generalized form of radio tag that is used on small birds. It's supposed to be general because any bird with a MODIS tag can be picked up at any of these stations, no matter where it was banded and no matter what species it is. The tag will, will send a signal when the bird gets within, I forget the exact distance, I think it's about 15 or 20 miles of a tower, it sends a signal and um, the signal will record the time, the altitude of the bird, <laughs> of the signal, um, and it will attempt to figure out the speed. Depending on the complexity of the MODIS device, they can sometimes give you enough trajectory information that you can actually guess the direction and speed the bird was moving in when it was going overhead especially when combined with radar information, that's really valuable. So what you can see here though, is the MODIS tags, cheap, general, easy to use. And they produce these, these nice straight line maps that show from a station to a station to a station to a station. They don't necessarily show every single longitude and latitude that the bird actually in real life passed through, but they show you every time it pinged a tower which in North America in particular is pretty darn good. You can see on whoops, this map that the East Coast, the Great Lakes, and the Northern Appalachians are pretty well covered by MODIS tags. These days, it's hard for bird to get across the Mid-Atlantic and Great Lakes without being detected. Um, and there are plans to increase these networks. There's a plan active to extend the chain down the Southern Appalachians from this cluster near Pittsburgh all the way down um, into North Carolina. There are plans to extend the line along Lake Erie all the way up into uh, towards Buffalo and just sort of start to close up some of the features on this map so that you're getting even more of the birds passing over. So it's still great, still provides a lot of really good information. Um, these are both just kind of standard examples. The ones on, uh, on the side with the white map are, are Bobolink and that is the Bobolink being shown in black from his uh, MODIS tower, the first MODIS tower he was detected at in South America, all the way up the coast to his breeding area in Maine. The other one is a red knot showing his first detection at MODIS towers. There are a few MODIS towers up along Hudson Bay, mostly four shorebirds. Um, and they picked him up as he came south and then more of them picked him up as he moved down the coast. And then of course there was again a jump while he was over water. A similar thing is gonna be shown um, at this guy on the side. This one was a, I'm trying to remember now because I pulled this one up earlier today and forgot what it was. This was a, this was a rail. This was a clapper rail. Um, and so you're seeing a very similar thing. You're seeing the first pickup somewhere in South America. The detections dramatically increase as it moves over the East Coast and then begin to taper off again as they begin to move up towards um, Nova Scotia. And this is a, co a collective of numerous years. That's why we have multiple lines here. This is the same individual bird back and forth over several years worth of data. Now with the tags that talk directly to satellite, GPS tags and Argos tags are what those are called. They give even better, finer grade detail, and it's really awesome. And it's actually really hard to find great visual examples of it because this part of the technology is so new and so expensive that there's not a lot published about it yet. Um, this was the kind of tag I was using last summer. Um, and so I can tell you a little about how cool it is to open up your computer and see where a bird you banded last week is now and to see that it has moved you know, 78 miles and see exactly where that was. It's awesome, awesome real-time information. On um, 
these are two examples that do kind of show what it can look like, though. Um, this one on the side of Alaska, this photo of Alaska, or this map of Alaska with the red marks, this shows all common mirror, which is a seabird. It's a kind of a sort of a puffin like bird. Um, and it shows all of the common mirror detections by Argo satellite in Alaska over the course of a season. Um, what this is trying to show is that you can track the feeding patterns of birds in and out of particular colonies. So this one that's over on the kind of um, southeast corner of the map on the far side of the peninsula, you see those birds weren't going very far to feed. Whatever was going on there, whatever fish or, or uh, stock they were relying on was really productive and, and consistent. Whereas these ones that were breeding out in Bering Sea, especially the ones that were in the south of the Bering Sea, they were moving a lot. You can see there's not sort of a consistent path for those birds. There are a bunch of marks all over. So those birds were, were probably pursuing a much more dispersed feeding uh, um, opportunity. And again, these colonies up north you see are, are kind of somewhere in between. Some of them are pretty tightly clustered, but we've got some nice long straight lines that show some repeated out and back movements for foraging. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a simple version of what this can look like, but I do think it drives home the point. It kind of shows how you can get these individual maps that short it sort of will, will give you a little more info. And then this other one was from a study done with lesser black-backed gulls. Um, and what this shows, it's a little hard to see, but there are lines that are in white on that, and then there are lines that are colored dots. The white lines are the control birds. Those were birds that were normally moving back and forth on their migration route. And those birds were being uh, satellite tracked. That's how they got those squiggly spaghetti line looking trails. Those are exact satellite tracks of those lesser blackback gulls moving from Africa to um, the Baltic region and Russia. The colored dotted lines are also satellite tracked birds that had been displaced. This was a study to try and figure out why birds vagrate, why birds go places they shouldn't. You know, we've had some famous examples around Baltimore over the years. We've had a, we had a Kirtland's warbler a couple of years ago, which is a species very rare that nests in um, Michigan and breed, uh, winters in the Caribbean and usually goes down the Mississippi flyway. One popped up in Maryland. Who knows why? Probably it's because the population is increasing and the migration path is naturally expanding. But we don't know exactly. Um, there's lots of examples like that. And this was trying to figure out what are some things that can affect a bird's ability to home, so to speak, to get back from point A to point B if it's lost. So basically what they did with these gulls was they took them, they banded them, they satellite tagged them moved them, as you can see, many miles outside of the normal migration, these ones that were being released in sort of Central Africa over the Congo instead of over the, uh, the African Rift Valley, and see what happened to those birds. Now, I did not include the ones that were just the control um, because they were boring because the birds went the same way. The, the control birds and the test birds did the same thing. What I put in, were the birds where they had altered um, the trigeminal nerve and uh, had caused anosmia in. So birds that either had, in the case of anosmia, um, a olfactory uh, impairment, or in the other case, an impairment in um, the, not necessarily the optics itself, but the processing between the optics and the brain to try and figure out whether it's visual or olfactory cues that are playing a role. And you can see that it's it's both is really what this is showing is that um, in, in particular, the ones that are um, uh, on, the, on the left in the image here, on the side in the image here, um, all those birds you can see ended up in Further, further west in Europe, they missed that sort of uh, Baltic Sea landing zone that most of them were going for. The Russian birds did something a little different, but they still were clearly impaired. We had this one guy who, for some reason, decided to trek over Saudi Arabia and then over the Caspian Sea before he made it up to Russia. And we have this other guy that just sort of decided he was going to stop in Kazakhstan for no apparent reason. Um, so clearly both of these things, both the olfactory and the visual processing is helping these birds navigate. And that's something that, again, is really hard to see unless you're, you're doing these kind of tests where you can see real time movement of birds across a big landscape. 
and I just thought these were cool maps, honestly. I just thought they were really interesting um, visualizations of some of the, 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 it, the data you can gather this way. And then one more, because I, I, maps are fascinating to me. This is uh, Hope the Wimberl. This were, these were all of her migration patterns over a period of several years. You can see they're labeled uh, on the side here. And this was a bird that was being tracked with a uh, GPS satellite, because as you can see, we're, we didn't have a MODIS tag way out over uh, um, the North Atlantic here. That was a GPS tag of, a, of the bird. And the other reason that I included this image is if you'll see, this is the fall 2011 line that does this weird thing where it shoots out over Atlantic Canada and then scoots back in towards the coast and then scoots way down south before it straightens out again. You kind of see how all the others kind of follow a path. Either they get out over the ocean and book it south or they stay near the coast, except for that fall 2011 line, which does a bit of both. That was a hurricane that this bird was navigating around. They put the weather maps up against these tracks when they got them back to see what she was doing. When she turned, when there's that 90 degree turn was where she hit the edge of the low pressure bubble associated with the hurricane. And she knew based on the pressure change that that was no longer a good way to go. Navigated herself back to Cape Cod stayed there until the storm passed, and then rerouted herself from there, made it back to the South Atlantic, and then figured her route out afterwards. That's just, I, I get chills just telling that story. It's amazing to me that birds have the ability to do that, that they can navigate with that much accuracy. Um, and that they have that much homing capacity and that they are sturdy enough to navigate around a hurricane. I mean, the, the bird that this is, is a, a wimbrel, is a kind of a shorebird that's not really that much heavier than a pigeon. They're not huge. This is a lot of work for a bird to hit a hurricane edge, figure out what to do, fight it out to the west, and then reroute herself. It's, it's just, it blows my mind that birds can do that. Um, and it, it always has, it's always, that part will just always floor me. Um, so what next, sort of where do we, so we've got all that, we've got all these things, all these, these new stuff that, I, you know, as I said, for a lot of them, we're still learning about it. We're still discovering some of the things that these technologies can teach us. So this is sort of the, the thought I wanted to conclude on before I, I you know, take a few questions and conversation from anybody is on the, on the side with the bird here, this is a red knot. This is a red knot that I was, I, I'm not the one holding it, but I was one of the folks involved in the banding of this bird. This was in 2011, and this was a geotag, a geolocator tag, which took the bird's location in, in, uh, in relation to the angle of the sun when the sun was setting. When the bird took off to fly to its nighttime migration route, it was high enough in the air that the tag could tell where the sun was coming from and determine the location and the time of day based on it. And that's how it transmitted and stored data. And you needed to catch the bird every year to retrieve the data. And we would spend days, days trying to recatch a single bird to get data off of. This is a now federally threatened species. So this was not just us kicking around a can for fun either. This was important information that was contributing to the listing decision for this species. And we had no way to get it. We couldn't get step-by-step -step migration paths from them any other way than these geolocators. And as much of a pain as they were, we were floored. We were, we thought this was the the greatest thing in the world. We got such cool maps from the like, I don't know, three birds we caught again. <laughs> it was, we, we put something like two dozen of these on and only recovered half of them ever over a course of several years. But so, you know, it didn't, wasn't a ton, but we, you know, we thought it was unbelievable, the kind of information that we were getting. And that was in, you know, 2011, just a little over 10 years ago. We now have tags that can transmit by radio that can attach to a monarch butterfly. This tag on this monarch butterfly can transmit to the MODIS network, the same MODIS network that registers birds, and it can transmit this monarch's 
movements via modus. Again, that is just a, a, a flooring fact. When you think about 10, 12, 13 years ago, the fact we could put something on a, on a shorebird that we might someday get a year's worth of data off of. And now we can put them on practically anything and we can collect data continually. And there are still challenges and there are still things that we're figuring out. And there is still probably a lot of room for improvement in some of these areas. But to me, this sort of this, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have like any of this on birds this size. We were only tracking bird, you know, waterfowl and raptors. And then 10 years ago, we were thrilled that we could finally put some of this technology to use on something that was small. And now we have even better technology that can go on a butterfly. <laughs> um, and so it's just sort of like, where else are we going to go? You know, what else can we find out? It sort of is limitless at this point. It's, at least it feels from the perspective of the banders who are, who are suddenly learning all the things that we can do, um, is that th this is just kind of has opened up a whole world and is showing migration connectivity, it's showing the way different areas relate to each other, how ecology is intertwined, it produces great educational tools in the form of these maps. Um, I just really don't think it can be understated how far we've come in a lot of this stuff in a very short period of time. Um, and even though there's a lot still to be discovered, um, it, uh, it's getting uncovered. There's, there's a lot of really cool discoveries all the time using a lot of these techniques. So with that, um, if anyone has uh, any any questions or um, concerns or, or not concerns necessarily, but conversational moments, we have a few minutes for that, I'm sure, at the end. Um, I will stop talking for a couple seconds. And I think the way we've done this in the past is people can either put their questions in the chat and Bronwyn and I will read them out. Uh, or if you're comfortable, you can you can try uh, unmuting and shouting out, whichever whichever works for you guys. Well, Mike, Mike, thank yeah. you. Can you unshare? We'll come back together. I'll put a spotlight yes. on you. Um, yes. And then we'll can do that. Let me put a spotlight on you. <laughs> Mike, thank you. I just I just love learning from you. I learned so much and it's always um, a pleasure. Um, I like talking about it. Then I, I say that to everyone when they when, uh, who I do this is it, it's it's I love talking about it. It's such interesting stuff. So we have um, some we have some questions down here in the chat, and then if you want to unmute, just raise your hand, and I'll I'll call on you. Um, Terrence asks, "What what's, what is the last bird that you had? I don't know in the in the presentation, I guess." The last bird in the presentation, that was an orchard oriole. It was an orchard oriole, which it was just, that's my last bird in many of my presentations because I think orchard orioles are just so fun. <laughs> um, and and before before we get too far, we, we you have some bird banding dates scheduled yes. with us over at the Natural History Society. This will be our third year working with Burb um, and we're banding uh, a, a uh, was it five or seven different types of birds? And a suite of eight. Suite of, well, eight suite of eight. Although actually this year, um, so we, it, everything that Bronwyn was saying is absolutely right, except that for this year, for the first year, um, in addition to that suite of eight, I can ban some additional things because I have a new master's permit. <laughs> oh, great. And so, so we get to see more things than in the past, even. I always, I say that because I all, any, so with this banding that Bronwyn's describing, there were eight target species that I was trying, that I'm trying to catch that were color marking. Um, and typically I let everything else go. I would just, if it was really cool, I'd show it and then, but anything else got let go. But we can actually ban most of those other things now. And it I'm is, excited. they're May 10th and June 7th at 7 a.m. But Burb has branding events all throughout um, Baltimore area through the spring. And they could probably go to your website mm -hmm. and see those banding opportunities because it's a fascinating um experience if you haven't done it before or if you have done it before it's always great to go out and ban birds you get up close and personal with them and see them um as if you you know uh, for the first time in a, in a completely different way so i highly recommend that brianna wants to know are the modus towers all privately funded uh mm. curiously about the network it, it, they're not all privately funded, but most of them in the U.S. are. Um, in Canada, the story is different and more complicated. Um, in Canada, I believe many of them are supported by uh, by the government and by the state university system. 
Um, there are some private ones in Canada as well. In the US, it's almost entirely privately managed. Um, all of the MODIS towers talk to each other, so it is inherently cooperative. You can't silo MODIS data. Um, it, it's just, it's in, it's baked into the way the technology works that it, they all talk. So it doesn't necessarily matter who owns and puts up the tower once it's up, anyone benefits from it. Um, however, most of them are put up by um, nonprofits who raise money to put one up on their property or a banding station that um, writes a grant for it, or like the Maryland Zoo in Baltimore has one, you know, it tends to be organizations that have some kind of interest and stake in it, but it doesn't have to be. And there are beginning to be signs that the U.S. may be learning from the Canadian model a little bit. And there have been some signs um, of some municipal uh, managed sites that may be willing to host MODIS network or MODIS towers in the future. Um, it's an evolving, <laughs> evolving thing. Um, Good, good question, good question. All right, Tabby, you have your hand up, go ahead. Hi, yeah, I was wondering if there has been research on the impact that the bands have on the bird's behavior once they've been placed mm -hmm. compared to before they had the bands on? That's an excellent question, there has been. Um, there's actually been quite a lot of uh, research on that um, in a couple different venues and formats. Um, most birds, what they have determined is that if the band is under a certain weight, there's a certain percentage of the bird's body weight, that the bird does not notice that it is there once it's been on for about a day, that, that it sort of becomes like a person who is always wearing their wedding ring or their watch. Once it's on, if it's under a certain weight, the bird kind of, you know, it's there and it's there and the bird doesn't care. Um, the bigger thing than the having the bands on um, well, there's actually, so there's two, there's two things with that. The other, one of them is uh, you have to be careful with color bands because those can impact bird behavior. As you can imagine, birds that use colors to signal, if you add colors to them in funny places, you can affect that. So there are some tips and tricks with color banding as with anything else that you'll, you learn when you're around it. You should not use reds, yellows, or oranges with red-winged blackbirds. Um, you should not use reds with cardinals. Um, Though sometimes we still, that one's a little squishier, but the red winged blackbird one, everyone knows, don't use red and yellow with red winged blackbirds. Um, so you, there are some, some things that you wanna know and some things that you uh, should be aware of going into it. Um, and the same thing with the band size. That's one reason why it's important to know what band sizes you're using to have good, you know, to be familiar with the species that are in the area that you're going to be banding. Because the, the time it becomes a problem is if you're not using the right sizes and you're using a band that's too heavy or too bulky for that bird. That's when it becomes an issue. Um, to that end, I'm going to segue into the next question because it, it feeds right into it. Someone had asked, is the, the banding controlled by a central organization anywhere? What's the governing system? Um, it is. In order to band, I, I mentioned in passing that I have what's called a master's permit. In order to be allowed to do this, you have to be permitted by the federal government. The permit comes from the USGS. It's a very long process. It's a lot of work. Um, I spent most of last year just kind of working on that. Um, and, but when it, and what they do is they evaluate what a banders proposed purposes of banding are. So not just going to give it to anyone for any reason. You have to be able to show a valid scientific or educational purpose. And if it's educational, it has to be more than I just like it and I'm doing it to show people. There has to be some real teaching goal. Um, once that, that has been met, uh, sometimes that can involve multiple back and forth, submission of documents, conversations. You then also have to demonstrate that you have the appropriate skill. So everyone who's permitted needs to submit a complete record of every bird they've ever touched hands on in their life. Um, I keep one of those. I have a document that has all, at this point, 13,000 some birds that I've handled on it. Most banders have some version of that. You have to submit a copy of that with the full species spread, how many of each. Um, you have to get people to vouch for your skill level. You have to get people who've trained you to say, yes, we trained him properly. You have to get someone who has not trained you, but who has watched you work to vouch for you. Um, you often need an organizational sponsor. Once all of those conditions have been met, you get the master's permit and you can begin to work and you can begin to work under the protocol that you described to the bird banding lab that you described to the USGS. If you differ from that in any way, you have to 
edit the permit. You have to apply for an alternate uh, alteration to the permit. Um, so for example, uh, right now I am not permitted for hummingbirds because for hummingbirds, it is generally considered uh, that you have to have handled all of the North American hummingbird species. And there's two or three that I have not yet handled. Um, but should that happen, I, do, I can't just write the bird banding lab and say, I have now met the requirements, I'm gonna start banding hummingbirds. I have to submit a new plan about why I want to add hummingbirds to my permit, go through the whole process of documenting my skill again, getting all those people to vouch for me all over again in regards to hummingbirds now and add it that way. So it is very tightly managed. It's not easy to get the allowances to do this. Um, and you have to have a lot of prior skill um, to be considered eligible by the government. Wow. And Megan asked that, uh, that uh, they're doing hmm. some volunteer bird banding in the fall. <laughs> Any tips for a first timer? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So I, I all love it, people getting involved in bird banding. All that that I just set aside, all the technical knowledge and skill that you need, it's very rewarding and you learn a ton. I learn every single time I'm out holding birds that I discover new things. I I just this week had like two, two birds in the hand in, in just context I never had before. Um, and, and so it, there's a lot of value from it. Um, the best thing that I can say to get started is um, go into it with a very open mind and very calm. Um, bird banding can be stressful if you're new to it. Birds make a lot of sounds in the net and in the hand that they don't make otherwise, which are surprising to people. They're very strong. Birds kick and struggle and wiggle and fling their wings around. And they're a lot stronger than you think a little bird is. And they can wiggle a lot better than you think a small bird could. Um, so the best thing that I tell people is just go into it with a, you know, with the mindset that there's a lot to learn and you can be slow and patient and calm about it. You don't need to jump in and feel like you need to do everything right away and need to know everything. I've been, I started bird banding when I was 12 years old. That's the only reason I at this age know and can do as much as I, I do. Um, for most people, this is a very, very like lifelong learning process to, to, to jump into it is a great and exciting thing and an opportunity that I think lots of people should take if they have the advantage to do it. Um, but you, you need to be, you know, willing to experience birds in a very new way. It's, it's very different than birding. Um, you know, it's it's close. It's uh, you know intense in a in a very personal way because you've you've actually got the bird and you're you're looking at it and you're handling it. Um, there's a very sort of unusual grounding feeling that you get from that. Um, that is very 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 nice. I think I I, I love banding for that aspect. <laughs> uh, what species was it towards the end that detected the change in pressure? That one was a whimbrel, which is a type of a shorebird kind of a shorebird species. And, uh, they're, they're, but I will say, there are many other birds that they think can sense those pressure changes. The, the Wimbrel was one of the first species that they documented it in, and that sort of black and white stark away. Um, but there have since been lots of uh, examples of that. There've been other shorebirds that have since been tracked circumnavigating hurricanes. There has been a shorebird that has been tracked cutting across a hurricane, which I still boggles my mind. Apparently what he did is he, and they, they have the track so they can kind of see what he did. He, this, it was a, um, it was another wimbrel. It was a male wimbrel. What he did is when he got to the outer bands of the storm, he followed them around the circulation. And then when he got to the, the, the leeward side of the storm, he flew into the eye and then circled within the eye of the storm until the storm dissipated. How a bird can do that is beyond me. But again, they got to have some ability to detect the pressure and to see what's going on, to know that the eye of the storm is that way and you got to go around it to get to it. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, I wish I'd worked with Albatross. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> that's, that's one of the big gaps in my banding resume. I have not worked with very many water birds in that context. I've worked with a lot of songbirds. I've worked with birds of prey, shorebirds like uh, like Wimbrel and Red Knot, um, but I have not worked with ducks or seabirds very much before. I would very much like to. One year I was supposed to help with the brown pelican banding in the bay and I couldn't because it was too stormy, but someday, someday I'm going to do some waterfowl. 
All right. Any other questions for Mike? Mike was recently um, interviewed by Sheila Cast on mm -hmm. uh, WYPR's uh, television show, so you can look back and hear that presentation. Um, Mike's other presentations are also available on our YouTube channel, so I hope that you check that out because he is a wealth of information. Uh, he's been doing some field trips for, um, for the Natural History Society of Maryland. And if you get an opportunity to go out into the field with Mike, um, you will not be disappointed because your brain, it will be swollen with information <laughs> and, and, and fueled by um, his passion and enthusiasm. So um, I, I highly recommend um, spending as much time as possible um, with Mike and, and with the birds out there because, you know, with birds, <laughs> with birds are, are pretty cool um, animals to spend time with. Um, mm -hmm. And playing games about birds. I hope to see everybody at the Wingspan uh, tutorial and learning more about that and coming out and playing with us um, as well. So there's there's more than one way to celebrate and learn about birds um, <laughs> that we're learning about. Um, Mike, what what is what is something that you hope to learn um, moving forward with the banding that or that the bird community is hoping to a mystery that's out there that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. One of the biggest mysteries that still needs to be solved, and it's it's going to be soon because it's one that can be solved with a lot of these texts that I've described, where exactly the martins go in winter. Purple martins are widespread and they're common, and there's martin species in South America and Mexico and the Caribbean too. We still don't know where most of them actually winter. For big swallows that form huge flocks on migration and are easy to identify, we hardly know anything about where martins go. And, and it shocks me because they're, where, whether it's purple martins here in the US or Sinaloa martins in Mexico or gray-breasted martins in the tropics, like they're, in, they're around people all the time. We just don't understand their movement well. And that's one that I, I'm excited because I think martins are fascinating birds and I'm really excited for, for that one to start to get uncovered. Awesome. Well, we'll and when we when we figure that out, we'll have to have you back. We will, yeah. We'll have us, to come back and talk about it. <laughs> tell us where. Tell us where the Martins where they go. are. Where they all go. <laughs> I will. I will come back and let you know when they know. <laughs> Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this Must Learn Thursday. Um, I, and, and thank you, Mike, for coming in and sharing your knowledge. Uh, we have those two banding events coming up with us, but there are many more opportunities to band with Burb. Uh, so make sure you take, take an opportunity to go to their website and, and follow them on all the socials so that you know where they are and how you can get involved with their programming. Um, and I hope to see y'all next week as we learn about all of the different crabs, not just the blue crabs, all the different crabs of Maryland on Must Learn Thursday. So everybody stay well, stay curious, and stay outside looking at those birds. All right, everybody, take Thanks care. Thanks for having me, everyone. Have a great evening. Good night.